Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I'm your host, as always, James DeBugesso. This podcast explores topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research with an ongoing wondering about what it is we need to understand or can understand about psychedelics, about our experiences about psych- with psychedelics, about ourselves, and about life that allows us to work with our experiences in a way that adds the beauty, the joy, the capacity, the resilience the healthiness of our lives, um, as well as a way in which hopefully through the emergent intelligence of rapport and the power of questions create artifacts of exchange around psychedelics that are seeded into the culture as the culture grows and as more and more people come in to taking psychedelics as a consequence of the psychedelic renaissance and the shroom boom and all the rest, you know, by producing podcasts, essentially. It's a really nice way of saying this podcast features conversations that are hopefully beneficial to the individual and to the culture at large. Um, and today we're going to be talking about the other magic mushroom, the Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric. And in order to explore it, we've got none other than Amanita dreamer. Amanita dreamer is one of the most outspoken and established advocates for the Amanita mushroom. She suffered from severe anxiety and panic and was on benzodiazepines, a dependence to benzodiazepine for over 10 years, with five of those years attempting to unsuccessfully wane off them, which we'll talk about in the interview. Finding the Amanita muscaria not only changed her life, but saved it, which we also talk about in the interview. She has since developed a thorough and robust knowledge base for their safe use for the healing of trauma, anxiety, and panic attacks which she shares on her many vlogs on amanitadreamer.net. So in this interview, we talk about the pharmacology of Amanita. We talk about what the experience is like. We talk about safe use as well as various modes of preparation. And we also go into Amanita Dreamer's perspective on how and why it is that the Amanita mushroom is able to heal trauma, in particular, infancy trauma, pre-birth trauma. And uh, from there evolves into a question of what it is to live in a traumatized and traumatizing world and what it might be like to live untraumatized in an untraumatized and untraumatizing world in a place where home is a safe place and we feel it in the world that we live in. And of course, the role Amanita muscaria mushrooms play in that. I'm getting tripped up describing differentiating between the Amanita mushroom and Amanita dreamer from a uh, nouns perspective. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's what this interview is about. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised on how well this interview went. Not that I was uh, surprised that Amanita Dreamer had something to offer, but I was surprised that we ended up going to such beautiful and interesting places together. And uh, hopefully you're going to uh, enjoy this episode. Before we get into it, a big thanks to my patrons on Patreon, especially the people whose names are listed on the screen here on YouTube, uh, because those people are giving significantly. I mention Patreon on every episode because, of course, people come and people go, and because Patreon is the way in which I have been able to funnel full-time my cognitive bandwidth, my finances, and my time into producing the show, into producing a body of work around something that I believe in, something that clearly you believe in too, or else you wouldn't be in some sense uh, watching the show. At the very least, you're interested if you're if you're watching or listening. Um, and so I mention it because it's what allows me to have a reliable income base to continue to commit and invest that time, bandwidth, uh, psychic bandwidth, and money. Um, and it does so based on the generosity and support of people like yourself, of people who decided that, hey, I like what you're doing. I'm going to voluntarily offer you some money to help you keep doing it. And in the process, the show remains forever free. The show remains unhindered by efforts to commercialize, and it remains unhindered from reliance on any types of sponsorships that might contort or contract the content in order to sustain, sustain those sponsorships. So that's why I mentioned Patreon. That's why I'm so grateful for Patreon. It's just like as a concept, it's just so incredible. And as it as an actual thing in my life, it's been a true blessing. And thank you patrons very much uh, for helping to sustain the show. 
And if you aren't yet a patron and you're enjoying it or find it even, you know, reasonably enough interesting that you might like to buy me a cup of coffee once a month in order to help me keep making it um, and help it stay what it is uh, for everyone, you can do so by heading to patreon.com slash James to be Gesso. You could also leave a one-time donation, which would be really cool. You could do so through PayPal or cryptocurrency, and the links to that are in the description to this episode. So yeah, thank you for doing so. Thank you for supporting the show, and uh, thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this interview with Amanita Dreamer, episode 147 of Adventures Through the Mind, talking about the other magic mushroom. Enjoy. Great. Okay, so um, I got your... I got your list of possible talking points and um, I there are none of the talking points that I had sort of pre-established for us. Okay. So that's fine. What I'd like Better to do. Better to have more than you need than I don't know. True. Um, so what I'm thinking is to kind of go into what I've got here and depending on what kind of time we've got left to touch in on some of these topics. Um, because they are very interesting and I would be curious to get your perspective on it. Obviously it's a developed informed perspective. I, I, you know, being that you offered it as things you'd like to talk about. Um, but also for the podcast here, which we are now in, uh, we are, we are in the, we are in the interview now. Uh, I think it's great to get a foundation for Amanita Muscaria first, because I've never spoken about it on the show. Um, except once I had Tom Hatzis on to uh, debunk the theory that Santa Claus is some, you know, anthropomorphized uh, Amanita muscaria mushroom um, or a shaman or something like that. But other than that, I haven't talked about it because, and to be entirely forthright, I sort of dismissed Amanita muscaria. I dismissed it because... I didn't have any experience with it. And in all honesty, until I heard your work, I didn't hear anyone talking about it in any way that felt like it represented it as something more than, in some sense, sort of like a um, an insertion of value into the historical record through mental gymnastics and seeing mushrooms in, any, in everything. Um, and most of the people I've heard talk about their experiences, I couldn't. I couldn't conceive of how those would be beneficial the way a psilocybin experience would be beneficial. Um, so I had a number of preconceived, clearly in hindsight, um, narrow-minded biases that informed the lack of discussion of Amanita on the show. And I feel excited to I feel excited to have been clarified and my biases sort of checked by having watched your content in advance. But I also feel excited about getting a deeper sort of dive into this on the show. Um, and so then increasingly into the culture at large. So that preamble ambled on maybe a little bit longer than intended. Uh, so why don't we start off with you telling me about what the Amanita muscaria mushroom is, assuming I'm pronouncing it right, um, and a little bit about its pharmacology. Maybe, you know what, give me just a general sort of rundown of what is the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Everyone knows it as that bright red iconic mushroom that most people think is a stylized version, more fun to look at version of a psilocybin mushroom because psilocybes are brown and kind of boring. So everyone just styled it up. And in reality, it, it's an actual mushroom that doesn't have psilocybin in it. And it has iotinic acid and muscimol in it. And I always wondered why it had such this long history of being revered and it's so iconic. And at the same time, the word toxic and poison always accompany images of it. And I didn't understand that. I couldn't understand why the two, the two don't seem to go together. Those, those two images don't seem to go together. So when I was looking into it, which if uh, your listeners don't know who I am or haven't heard of me, the only way that I found that mushroom is because I have had a lifetime of struggling with anxiety. I had my first panic attack and wound up in the emergency room at 12 years old. And of course, back then, nobody even really knew what that was. And I kept thinking, this isn't right. Why can't medicine help me? You know, I was gaslighted. You're, you're worrying too much. You're pushing yourself too hard. It's you, it's you, it's you, because we don't have an answer. We think it's you and you've got to fix it. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of therapy, more gaslighting by therapists and 
school counselors and bosses and just you name it, you know, there's always these pat little slogans. And if you just try this and that, I mean, I went to every therapy, every tapping and EFT and EMDR and hypnosis. I mean, if it was out there, I did it. And it just kept getting progressively worse until Hurricane Katrina. And then the reality, that's when I had my first real existential crisis was, holy shit, how could I be an intelligent person and sit here in the heat with no power and no food and unable to care for my own children? Like I worried so much whether my curtains matched my couch and where the fuck am I now? And then that started the whole realization that just because I paid my taxes doesn't mean FEMA is going to be there. And they weren't just because I never missed an insurance payment didn't mean that they were going to get away with fraud and and theft. And they did. And I wound up forty thousand dollars in debt because of a natural disaster, even though I did everything right, everything I was supposed to do. And I just couldn't believe it. And I was so blown away by the whole experience. Wound up having to relocate, wound up having to file bankruptcy wound up at food banks and wondering when I was going to be homeless with children. It was the most awful experience. I was so panic ridden. I mean, I already had an issue with anxiety. So after two weeks of a constant panic attack and no sleep and just, you know, I mean, I had panic attacks, but they would always abate and give me a break. But this one, after two weeks, I was in the corner just shaking and crying and literally losing my mind. And I knew I had to get on something. And if ever there was a justification for benzodiazepines, I was I was that case. So I wound up on benzos and that was OK, except then, you know, the other side of that is you still can't function because you can't think. And after five years on benzos, I couldn't function. I, I had to give up my career. I had to get so much help. Just to, I couldn't even make a grocery list. I couldn't cook. I couldn't do anything. And my children were having to help me more and more. And it just it wasn't living. But then trying to come off of them was was a nightmare. And if any of you have ever had to go through withdrawals from benzodiazepines or have ever heard anyone talk about it, it's not like the hell that I hear meth or heroin can be where it's just a physical assault on your body where you really just feel like you're dying. This was not only that with intense physical pain, spasms, shooting pain, electrical pain, throbbing pain, migraines, but also a mental anguish that, and I, I think we'll probably get touch on this, that make the worst bad trip I've ever had look like a beautiful summer day in Central Park compared to what I went through mentally and emotionally trying to come off benzos. And it would get so bad, I would get so low on my dosing and have to go right back up because I couldn't function. I literally couldn't stand the pain and the lack of sleep and the mental anguish anymore. And then life would happen, you know, some big bill would come in and I, that's it. I just had to go back up. And I'm a very strong person. I was like, I can't believe I can't do this. I'm not going to put myself in an institution to get off these things. I can deal with this. I'll do it again. Five years of going up and then struggling over a year and a half to get to the lowest dose. A year and a half in and I can see the end and it just being so horrible that I would have to go up just to get a break and then life would happen. So after another five years of that, I was suicidal mm -hmm. because I couldn't live with the panic. I couldn't live with the medicine. I was no longer a functional member of society. I was a pain in the ass to my family. I was seeing a, a life where I would basically have Alzheimer's and, you know, at a young age and could possibly live another 40 years draining my family and finances to what occupy a meat sack like that's pointless. And I didn't want to live like that. I'm an intelligent, fun, beautiful, giving human. And I just didn't see the point. And I was suicidal. I planned it. I traveled to my daughter to see her one last time. I got an, an attorney. I made my will. I planned out how I was going to do it, make sure nobody would find me except a trained person. But you know, was trained to see those things. Mm -hmm. And so that's it. I'm out. I'm done. And I was actually really at peace. I was actually looking forward to it. And I thought, you know, I'll go. I, I could feel like Wednesday is when I was going to do it. And it was a Monday. And I'm like, well, I'll go walk in the woods. And I went walking in the woods in August. And there was this freaking bright mushroom. I have a picture of it on my Instagram. I mean, you, you in this landscape of just greens and browns this bright thing and i'm like what the 
that is not even real. And I went and looked at it and it was a, a mushroom and I'm like, what is I picked it and brought it home and looked it up and it was a flammable vada. But that quickly led me to muscaria. And I'm like, holy shit, they're real. Like I thought they were just made up. And then I saw the actives in them. And I'm like, oh, wow, they really are like trippy psychedelic. That's cool, you know. And then I saw that they hit the GABA. And I'm like, the GABA receptors in the brain. And I was like, son of a bitch. That's the natural version. That's the nature answer I've been looking for my whole life. Can this actually be a thing? Like, is this really the thing? Because, you know, you do that. No, this will be the answer. No, this will be the answer. And after so much failure, you know, I didn't want to hope, but I thought before I leave the planet, I have to give this a try. And I was on the lowest dose of, of benzos I could tolerate. I was on probably 10% of my dose. And so I felt good about it. And right when I made that decision, they just started popping up everywhere. Mm. Real muscaria started popping up everywhere. So I harvested them. I did my research. I watched Psych Substance take them and he didn't die. And I'm like, well, if they kill me, they did me a favor. So I'm, I was going to take a low dose, but I took too much and I tripped on them. And I have my trip report on my website. And when I woke up the next morning, I felt like I was walking into a new life. I now know what, what resurrection feels like and what being born again feels like in the truest sense of the word. I physically felt like I walked through a door as I sat up and moved forward. I felt it peel away from me. Every bit of panic and anxiety I've ever had in my life was gone. And I cried and fell to the floor because I couldn't, I couldn't believe this was happening to me or the sadness of how I've lived my whole life when the answer was that easy and beautiful. Now, the night before was a a bit of a difficulty, but that whole thing, I just, I kept thinking, okay, but now the panic and anxiety will be back. Just give it an hour and it'll be back. And it never came back. And that was two and a half years ago. And that mushroom saved my life. And I couldn't believe nobody was talking about it. I couldn't believe the, the negativity about it. I couldn't believe how everyone was missing the point. So I said, okay, if you can microdose psilocybin, you can microdose this. That's where the medicine is here. So I set out to find a a good microdosing protocol. And it was it was a a miracle. I never took another benzodiazepine again after that night. Hmm. So, okay, we've got we've got a foundation now in your uh, in your background, how you came to Amanita uh, or Muscaria, as you refer to it, how how you came to this mushroom. Um, And I'd like to what you've come to seemingly understand about what it is that the mushroom is, what it offers and how it benefits a person's healing process in particular, um, how, as you, as you've said in your videos about it, reparenting early parts of life, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, that's the stuff that I'd really, I'd really like to dig into. Um, and first, I'd like to I'd like you to touch on, you had said that you found out that the active, so the psychoactive out, I assume it's an it counts as an alkaloid. I'm not sure if that's the proper technical technical term, but the psychoactive metabolites of the amanita are two molecules, from what I understand, and those molecules are actually very similar to um, uh, is it glutamate and uh, glutamate and GABA? Is that correct? Because like. And and it's yeah. um, ibotenic acid and muscimol. So, mm-hmm. uh, if you could give us a rundown of like what are what's the what's the what are these molecules? How do they relate to these uh, these receptor sites in the brain? So the ibotenic acid and muscimol. Ibotenic acid is the way it's found in nature, and like a lot of the entheogens, go through a shift, a decarboxylation process into an, another. And so this goes from ibotenic acid and turns into muscimol through a, a very simple single decarboxylation reaction. It's a very, very simple thing to do. And people always vilify the ibotenic acid side because in high enough doses, it, it's toxic to our bodies. But I mean, all toxins are dose dependent. You can't just say it's just toxic. 
And you can say, well, yeah, you can about the deadly mushrooms, you know, just one bite and it can kill you. Well, yeah, it's dose dependent. It's a very, very tiny dose. But we don't reference ayahuasca as the deadly ayahuasca, you know, and it's like, well, this mushroom isn't deadly and neither is ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is definitely toxic. It'll make you sick, but that's not how we reference it. So I want more than anything to stop the rhetoric about its toxicity. I'm not arguing it's a toxin, but we consume so many things that are toxins and everything is dose dependent. And furthermore, I believe ibotenic acid is very important and serves a very important function for for humans. And the science, I, I defend my stance in a video on my website. I can go into it here, but just suffice it to say that the studies are from the 60s where they injected it into rat brains and then made assumptions and, and looked at it and said, blah, 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 this is what we know now. And then that has not been updated ever since. And yet we talk about it like if you consume it orally, it's going to be neurotoxic the same way it is if you inject it into a rat brain. Like, number one, that's not oral ingestion. Number two, that's a whole lot of injecting junk into brains. And when do you ever mainline something into your brain? <laughs> and then three, those are rat studies, not human studies. So like you can't even make that extrapolation at all. So the ibotenic acid, when you speak to people who have generations of use, talk about using it for power, for energy, for focus. And today I would say um, helping neurodivergent people with attention and focus and anybody who's tired and needs to keep focusing and working. And so I ate it on camera. That's exactly what happened. It was an amazing experience. And then everything, you can decarb it 10%, 20%, 50%, all the way to full decarb into the muscomol side. And the muscomol side then is the part that is the agonist for GABA, which is the calming side of it. Is it similar, analogous to benzodiazepines? They hit different A versus B receptors in, in the GABA line, but it does very similar things. And it's very calming, but clearly healing, which isn't surprising when we look at entheogens and what they do. They don't, they're not just symptom removers. They seem to be problem solvers, changing structures in the brain, changing neurons, changing physiology. And while there is no science yet on this mushroom, I'm, I already have experienced it myself far beyond anything that would constitute a placebo effect. And then since making the channel and being amazingly fortunate enough to come in contact with thousands of people now that have used it, I am convinced it is neuroprotective and that both need to work in conjunction in the brain and that it's not the goal to just get the muscomol out of it, but that different people have different needs. And if you don't know what you need, let the mushroom wisdom help you decide. And that's why I always say go in microdosing first. That way you can decarb a, a 50% and then microdose it and you're not going to be at risk of toxic effects. And then if you work through the microdosing protocol, you've given your the mushroom a chance to do the work that it needs to do. I believe it is adaptogenic in that way. Not only the IBO side being adaptogenic and helping to work on the two sides of the brain, the corpus callosum communicating with each other, but also helping to turn on parts of the brain that tend to turn off in neurodivergent people with ADD, ADHD in helping focus when they need to focus in certain areas. But also that muscomol would be an adaptogen, also healing the acetylcholine, norepinephrine, GABA pathways so that you're not freaking out and panicking and having PTSD trauma all the time. So not only do I believe both of those are adaptogenic, but I believe together they also work to be adaptogenic to help balance those two sides of the fight or flight system that in this day, I believe is terribly broken in most humans. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, there's, there's a lot of, from what I understand, since there isn't really a lot of science established now, there's a 
there's a lot of uh, sort of conjecture on the neural mechanisms of the benefits um, right now between. That's the, all I have is conjecture. For sure. That's it, all I'm saying is this is my uneducated, ignorant, not medical science opinion. Sure. And, and, and I just wanted to make clarify that we don't know for sure, but you are coming from a place of having a lot of experience probably in researching the brain, in researching what is in, um, what is actually in the mushroom and from your experiences of it. And I assume extrapolating from there to get some sort of hypothesis as to what it's doing in the brain that allows for the benefits you've experienced. Um, and yet, well, we let me clarify, we do have the science on muscomol mm -hmm. and what it does do to GABA receptors and acetylcholine. And there's recent studies hinting that it also um, tweaks dopamine a little bit. Um, we're learning more about how it's metabolized in the body and converted to diabetic acid. So that much we do know, but that's it. Everything else is just anecdotal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, found, I, I am definitely interested in um, in what you discovered experientially and is and is possibly sort of pharmacologically um, happening to have recovered or repaired whatever damage there might have been to your. Um, to your gabinergic system that A, led to the anxiety, and B, was likely the consequence of the uh, benzodiazepines taken for so long as a way of correcting whatever was going on with your GABA system that had you leading into high anxiety, being that benzos are gabinergic drugs, and now you're talking about the benefits of muscomol from your experience to have sort of cleared that out. Um, and uh, that was something when I listened to your initial talk about um, about having recovered out of this panic and anxiety at a really beautiful, it's like a 40 minute video and yet still very entrancing the whole time to keep my attention, um, uh, talking about that. So, um, I'd like to get into, you have, um, beyond sort of the pharmacology, your theories on the pharmacology, you have some incredibly interesting language and theory around what it's doing to our what it's doing to our psychology in order to help create positive benefits in our lives. Um, and it has to do like the question here is kind of big because I don't understand it enough to ask it in a very focused way. So I'm asking it sort of big, hoping that you're going to focus it in for me because you have the greater knowledge on this, obviously, um, which is something like uh, what is its benefits and how does it relate to what you call the sleep? So. It is my theory that this mushroom, so if you look at the different entheogens, and I'm just going to talk about the ones that I know or understand because I haven't worked with very many and there are so many, but in, in general, Amanita works on the self. It is a very self-focused mushroom. So it would work on your sense of self from birth up until around age six, which we know is a developmental milestone where you slowly become less narcissistic and start to focus more on relationships. And then that from six to around 10 then is where you start to develop relationships. And then when puberty kicks in, you become very relationship focused. And I believe that the psilocybes then work on your relationships to other people and anything that that happens that's traumatizing in relation to other people and how other people may have failed you or caused you trauma and your involvements in in society and in the world. And then ayahuasca DMT works on your relationship to the biggest questions of reality, universal questions. Why am I here? Questions. And so along those lines, then Amanita works on it's why it's called the power mushroom it's why it's called the sleep mushroom because the memories that you make and that you write from for neurotypical people aren't really available to to us today from pre-birth to age six i see when i talk to a lot of neurodivergent people i am one we tend to have memories going back pretty far sometimes all the way to birth and I am one of those people. I think mine go back to about six months old. And so a lot of people don't have access to that memory. Plus, we write memory very differently. Our brains are very different during those ages, the way we perceive reality 
and the way we're actually interacting with it and then writing those memories. And we have the internal mechanisms that we're writing things to a permanent vault, which gets closed around age six. And then everything from then on is sort of how we will approach and define the world once that vault is closed. And then we have another sort of set of memories where we write fluid memories that are actually happening that that relate to other people and, and how we move with the world and, and what we perceive colors and sounds and all that. And we don't really perceive colors and sounds the way we do when we're older. And they're much more of a fluid thing because of that childlike wonder. Whereas once we're older, blue is definitely blue. Red is red. Things are just a little more concrete. Whereas a child, things aren't, nothing is concrete. Everything is capable of being fluid and changed and magical and meaning anything, right? So what Amanita will do then, if you have trauma from pre-birth up to around six, seven, eight, whatever, then that those are the issues that Amanita heals. Those are the things that therapists will work with you for years that that any therapy book will say those are the hardest things to change and fix because they're written in that vault and closed. And that's why there's hypnosis and all that to try to get into that vault. I believe Amanito just walks right in, opens it up and starts yanking shit out. And it's like, yo, you don't need that. You don't need that. And it can do it pretty effectively the same way a psilocybin can do, do what they do. It can be almost miraculous, you know, just one one trip on it. And so the reason it's the darkness and the sleeper, and I have a lot to say about it and trips on, on this mushroom is because when you go into that vault, it's not the same memories. You're, you're not perceiving the world the same way you do as an adult. So when you're going back and you're in that place where the mushrooms doing that work and, and your reality is focused in those areas, it's very, it's dark because you're trying to be an adult going back to, to revisit things that were written in a way that a child did. And you're not that child anymore. You don't have those eyes and you don't have that, that reality and that vision anymore. So it looks like you're in a dark room. You're very aware you're in a room. You're very aware there's other beings there. You're very aware of yourself there. Your selfness is actually very large where in a suicide trip, you lose yourself. I think that you, in an Amanita trip, you you go so deep into yourself that yourself is all that you're surrounded by and you lose the concept of selflessness so that you can tinker in what happened and now have a chance to write it in a healthy way. And some of that shit can be so traumatizing and we can be so unaware of its existence that it can be shocking and the whole thing will just power down. And then you're rendered where you can't, you're not allowed to witness it because it's too painful. And in the mushrooms, love and wisdom, it it knows when to say when, when it's going to be too traumatizing for you to continue to be a witness to this. And it it will shut it down. It will keep working, but you'll think that you're dreaming, except that when you wake up, you know you weren't dreaming. And you may or may not remember it. And if you don't remember it, that's part of the wisdom of the mushroom. But you will definitely be different and changed from the experience. And I think this is why people who think tripping is sights and sounds are missing what tripping is, in my opinion. And that's why they wouldn't like this mushroom. And that's why it has such a bad reputation. But before you do the sleep, there is a fun part to it. And then after you wake up from the sleep, there's a second round two part of it. And depending on how much you took, where, what country it came from, the kinds of actives that were in it, the, all that is going to determine, you know, the more fun or terrifying side that you get to actually experience. Hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm very curious about, about what's, what the experience is like beforehand and then afterwards and what the differences are um between the fun or the terrifying so maybe we can just put a pin in that and hopefully we both remember because i'd like to get you to outline a little bit more by what you mean by the statement that amanita is here to reparent you because my understanding of it from what i'm getting from you is something like you know how those 
uh, pre-birth to, what did you say, six, six years old, how yeah. those memories are formed, how they impact our relationship to ourself and our sense of self has a lot to do with the manner by which we are parent and the degree to which our parents are lovingly attuned to our needs and our natural healthy expressions of things. And any deviation from that is a type of wound around which a compensational pattern will emerge anywhere from being disingenuous to having perpetual panic. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. So you know how it's pretty simple. Life as a baby is simple. And that is that I am the only thing that exists and my needs are the only things that matter. And that's normal and that's how you should be and that's how you get your needs met. And then if those needs aren't met, the only conclusion is I don't matter. I am worthless. I will die now. And that is the simplicity of, of being that little. And a toddler is very simplistic emotionally. And that is, I need this now. Damn it. Give it to me now. I will throw a fit if I don't get what I need right now. Really? You're not going to give me what I need? Well, I'm going to raise a bigger fit. And then the punishment and, oh, wow, I never should have asked for what I needed. Mm. Wow. Because the parents are all knowing and they're always right. And so those years are so simple. I'm worthy. I'm important. I am unworthy, I'm worthless, I am valueless. And it, that's it. I mean, it's really simple. And then as you grow, you start to get a little bit more complex in your understanding of yourself and the complexities of interaction and communication and value. But it really is pretty simple for most of that time. So then we wind up, if we're wounded in that way, being in the world in a very narcissistic way out of just a sense of survival but also because we see the world in a very black and white simplistic way because we were so damaged at that age. Mm -hmm. And you can overcome that on the surface and make complex relationships, navigate the world, learn how to show empathy, learn how to care, learn how to nurture, learn how to love, overcome codependent behaviors, learn how to set boundaries in a very healthy way. But you won't heal the fact that, that it's still very broken inside you that you're walking around feeling nothing but shameful, empty, worthless, and valueless, and that you don't deserve anything that you manage to ask for for yourself. And on the surface, people think you're such a, a, a selfless giving person. And there's a thin line between being giving and feeling valueless and worthless. And I learned that. Mm -hmm. So then what Amanita is going to do is go in and give you your power back and remind you that, you know, that you it reminds you of your birthright. And that is because you're here, you are of value because you have source energy. You are of value because you are taking up space on the planet and you were granted that then you own the right to take up your space on the planet. It's very simple. And the mushroom corrects that mistake and just in that way covers everything. It reparents everything because every mistake and punishment and slight and trauma that happens in those years comes back to that very simple thing. And in one fell swoop, Amanita can correct that. And then once you get those seeds planted, then it's a matter of, you know, just continuing the work, tweaking it, microdosing it, large dosing again, just to build on that. And it's pretty simple. I don't, I don't think it's complex at all. Hmm. Yeah. I'm thinking about what you said there, that you can go through the work of building all these complex relationships. You can adapt to that early life stuff in a way that, you know, generally you're living a pretty good life. And most of the time, you're going to feel all these, the consequences of living that pretty good life. But at some point, you know, if that, if that deep wound isn't, you know, addressed in some way, at some point, it gets activated, you know, and it becomes very apparent. And it's also insidious, we don't remember it. And thus, we don't see it when it's directing even what appear to be positive behaviors. And it's sort of shadow side expresses once those positive behaviors aren't met with a with some sort of acknowledgement or reciprocity that you know sustains its need to it's uh, its need to exist as an adaptation to that early wound so 
I'm curious about this idea that Amanita goes in and finds those places and reparents in a way that those wounds aren't there and then what's possible on the other side of that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting. The thing that's been surprising to me is how far reaching a sense of a lack of ownership of oneself, how that reaches into literally every aspect of being on earth and trying to be a human. Mm -hmm. And when that's broken, you're limping along and your body knows it. And that's what the anxiety is, is when you're wounded in those years, your body knows it. Anxiety is that warning system for the emotional self to say, you are not okay here. And the older you get, the more there's, there is to be anxious about because now you've got more experiences that you failed or that you've screwed up sure. and then more punishments and then more failures in life and more triggers and then triggers become PTSD. And then you've got more PTSD until you're just a ball of anxiety 24 seven. And it's just, it's one of those things that just, Eventually, it's going to catch up with you. If you keep living, it's going to catch up to you. And then the only answer that keeps looping back around is you're worthless and valueless. And you can only hear you say that to yourself until that voice gets so loud that you become suicidal. Like that's that's it. There's there, that's where the end of that road goes. Hmm. Yeah, you know, the first person that uh, encouraged me to check out your work was someone named Douglas Tatarin, and he does a lot of work around core feelings and uh, identified like seven or nine core feelings that there's a negative and a positive side, and that the, a core feeling is different than an interpersonal feeling, which is different than an emotion. An emotion is happy, mad, sad, uh, fear. Um, and an interpersonal feeling is something that is about another person you know, abused is about another person, how I feel about another person, um, uh, disrespected about another person. Core feelings are about the self. So I could feel abused. That's the interpersonal feeling. And the core feeling can be something like I'm worthless, right? I'm abused and it's because I'm worthless or something like that because it's logical and emotions aren't logical, but he identifies um, worthless, helpless, hopeless, inadequate, lost, loss, um, alone, possibly that's it. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Cause like there's possibly Amanita's going in and helping to sort of like correct the wounds around which these, what he calls feeling beliefs are established, which now makes a lot of sense as to why he suggested for me to check out your work. Um, and I also think it's, it sounds like good work to be doing. I mean, like all of this psychedelic work is good work to be doing, especially reparenting work, because if we're going to live in a better society and, and build a culture that is an actual culture of, of humans and not a, not a system of, of like, I think Stephen Jenkinson says something like culture, like a, like a, this is not his language, but something like a real culture is human making, you know, and the culture that we live in is not really a culture. It's a machine that churns out, churns out consumers, right? So if we're going to like be, you know, picking up the sort of spiritual project of our generations right now, which is to really sort of like autocorrect from this machine that we're in to actually craft human cultures again, because most of us don't have it because I am the descendant of the colonialist conquest of much of the indigenous world. And I am itself an extension of that colonial conquest because I only am a part of it because it was once conquered by Rome, which became so on and so on and so forth. Um, I don't have a culture. I only have this machine, really. So I'm thinking about you know what what happens when we're able to reparent and reculture in a way that allows for the cultivation of a different way of being in the world, right? I love how excited I'm getting you are. excited. <laughs> Amanita does is it is the culture, elders, ancestors, celebration, going home mushroom. So not only does it take you home inside the self, but then the mushroom itself says, as a people, as an animal on the planet, you need to go home. You've lost your way. And a lot of that was in losing your cultural practices and the use of this mushroom. And they've enjoyed a long history with the humans. And I don't believe we were supposed to live with this amount of trauma. 
We need the fight or flight system. We need warnings to become lessons for our survival, but we weren't supposed to live with lasting trauma from them, only the lesson from them. And that if we had been using this mushroom like our ancestors did on a regular basis as a normal part of life, we would not know what it's like to live with trauma. That, that would be a very unusual experience. Anxiety would be purposeful and, and necessary, and we would pinpoint it and say, thank you. And this mushroom, the way that the mushroom explained it to me was we went through a divorce and it seemed right at the time, but now we miss each other and we are broken without each other and we need to go home. And see, when I say it, like, it seems like such a simple sentence. I can't say it without crying. I feel it in the depths of my being. And the mushroom is saying, you need to celebrate again like we used to. You need to make fires. You need drums. You need to come together as a people regularly and celebrate and use us again. Let us be there. We miss you. This is part of our purpose here. And you've taken it away from us. But it's also part of you being fully expressive in who you are and what you are. And you've lost your way. And the destruction that you see is because of your fear. And if you would come home, we can heal you and you can find your rightful place here again and feel good about your place here. And so that's what the mushroom tells me. And that is sort of like what I don't say Mm -hmm. all the time Mm -hmm. that is actually pushing me forward every day when I wake up. Hmm. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot to, there's a lot to unpack there. You know, the meaning of home, for example, um, even when you said ancestors, it's like, well, I don't know if my ancestors, like as in my biological and cultural lineage consumed Amanita, but if I were to expand from a sort of anthropocentric, very myopic understanding of lineage, then it's not, it's not unreasonable to say that, well, you know, those who came before me, or those who went before me, another way of looking at it, yes. you know, um, include the land and include the land of the whole planet. And perhaps, you know, the mushrooms, Amanita, are an extension of ancestry in that way. It doesn't have to necessarily be a connection explicitly with the fact that my biological history consumed Amanita, but that the ancestors of land are speaking to the in- present inhabitants of that land. And tr- what home means, that's a whole other question. But what's possible, I mean, I think a home, a healthy home is a home that doesn't exist on coercion, right? And and coercion is a way in which, and this is in reference to Gene Robertson's work of the collaborative and coercive mindsets. The coercive mindset basically expects you to, to succeed in a particular way of being that acknowledges some sort of priority that isn't necessarily genuinely what serves the person, but it serves something else and it's distorted. I don't know if she'd ever say that, but that's how I'm describing it now. And that coercion is how we basically use shame and guilt to make things right or wrong in order to manipulate people into fitting into what our narratives are about what's right or wrong, mostly to satisfy ourselves as a compensation for uh, that satisfaction itself needed because it's a compensation for having been shamed and blamed in our lives. And if we can get away from, you know, if I am deeply ashamed of myself because of my having been brought up in a coercive not home, then I need to flatten my representation of you anytime you challenge me in order to make you an enemy so that I don't have to feel shame. I don't have to feel how I feel about myself. I can make it about you, right? And then we get a lot of problems. But if that thing inside can be healed, then we don't necessarily need to have that. Then when you're like coming home to yourself, you know, it also means being able really to come home with the feelings that otherwise wouldn't feel good because I don't anticipate eating Amanita means that you never feel hopeless anymore or you never feel shame or you never feel, you know, like like you've made a mistake or something, you know. And actually, I would imagine that with, with a proper reparenting on the core, we're actually able to hold those things in relationship to each other in a, in a way that actually allows for the human relationships necessary for proper culture making to uh to sort of feed back onto itself to something something akin to what a proper home might be i mean that's me just riffing (laughs) that's me riffing well i can tell you my take on this on the home thing is firstly amanita grows on almost every continent on earth 
The only one that it's not really prolific on is the African continent, although they are found in South Africa. But that's only because of the the climate, you know, and that hasn't always been the climate there. And they didn't always they weren't always on the Australian continent. That's a more recent thing because of human travels, you know, and, and transporting the spores in there. But there's all there's a lot of land left over besides those two where this mushroom is found historically. That's a lot of people and a lot of lineage and a lot of culture. However, to me, what I get from this mushroom is that home is what you said about the self, firstly, but home in relation to other people as humans coming together. And so that doesn't necessarily mean your birth relatives or your DNA genetic heritage. It means like you and Rob were talking about finding your tribe. And what do we mean by mate or tribe? Or community. And to me, it's finding others that you feel safe with, to let go with, to travel and journey with, to celebrate with, that you consider home. And so in that respect, there's something about celebrating with other humans around a fire. And this just goes back to every continent and every human. And we have evolved with fire and we've evolved with drums. Every single culture has drums and we know drums can be very hypnotic and can induce hypnotic states that are very similar to the kinds of places we can go on in theogens. And when you try to separate entheogenic use from drums, I don't think that you can, you know, when you put all of that together, the fire, the drums, the communion, the people, the food, the entheogen, this is what humans have been doing for thousands and thousands of years on solstices and full moons and traveling long distances to do this. And so it's it's a journey, it's a right, it's a privilege, it's a, a joy, it's a necessity, but we have continued to grow and evolve as human beings generation after generation along with these things. And I don't believe you can separate our mental health from those things. And that when you do, you get mental broken. And this is what the mushroom tells me that my calling is to try to help us remember those things, make a fire wherever you can make a fire, invite people around, play drums, play music, take whatever you can take that helps you feel in alignment, make tea, medicinal teas, eat together, find your tribe. And I don't think that is a wrong direction or too much to ask, even for the current construct. I think a lot of us can try to find that. And I think a lot of us are looking for that. And I've been looking for it my whole life. And I couldn't find it. And I'm finding it now. I do retreats now. I just had the first one on the summer solstice. I'm doing another one on the winter solstice. And we make the fires and we do the Amanita and we eat and we play drums and we remember. It was really beautiful. I rambled. Mm -hmm. That's great. We're, it's a ra <laughs> we're rambling together. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, finding, finding your tribe. I mean, that's, that's kind of a complex process too, because, um, trauma confuses our perceptions of safety and danger and we can find safety in places where it's actually dangerous. And, and if we don't know any better then you know, we'll own, end up in our tribe, but our tribe is something akin to the worst expressions of tribalism rather than coming to the kind of home I think that you're that you're pointing towards, you know, something like uh, something like um, a young woman who was abused by her father is likely to find herself in some sense feeling safe in a relationship with a man that abuses her because although it is dangerous on a deeper level, it's the only love she's ever known. Something like this, um, and also something like, you know, we that. Uh, that the distress of the, the the distress of our wounded feeling states is pretty distressing, but not as distressing as our feeling states being incongruent with the reality outside of us. And so, back to Douglas Tatarin, we'll look around and we'll find people who treat us the way we need to be treated in order to validate how we feel about ourselves, or we'll train people to treat us that way. Um, and if we're not healing those wounds, then how can we even have a conception of what a real home properly is? Um, and how can we heal those wounds 
and even recognize there's a wound to be healed when the society that we're living in is sort of the almost the antithesis of the kind of home that you're describing here. Now, that's what the beauty of Amanita is, in my opinion, is what what Amanita can do pretty quickly in taking away that anxiety and healing those things that that need to be healed inside you and pretty quickly is in the absence of that pain and anxiety. When you do then try to do these things that seem safe, pretty quickly, you're going to get those alarm bells. And now you can hear them where before you couldn't. And now they become intolerable. And yeah, you know, I've lived my whole life in just about everything you've said since we've started this thing. When you discuss the negatives and the possible negatives, I'm like, yep, you you described my life. And, you know, it's why it's just been a shit show. I wound up suicidal because I was enacting, you know, acting out all of those things that I thought were safety and all that. And so that was the coolest thing about Amanita for me was in the absence of panic and anxiety. All of a sudden I could hear that inner voice go, wait, this is not cool. Wow. No wonder you've been so stressed out. You thought this was good. You allowed this. Can you imagine how much stress and anxiety you were living with and not even able to hear it explained so much. And I question, I don't know. I have no idea. I'd like to hear from other people that have been through this, but I question people that uh, can take Amanita either large doses or microdosing or both, and then continue to go and repeat the same bad behaviors. I, I would, I would like to know if that's, what people get when they do that, because what I'm getting on my end, what I'm seeing from the people who are willing to talk about it is they just suddenly find all that stuff just unbearable and, and intolerable and, and repulsive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I've never consumed them. Anita. I'd like to ask you some questions about that. Um, at some point, not too long from this moment. Um, but one thing that comes up for me when I think about my work with psilocybin, where I am much more proficient and sort of, uh, you know, established, practiced, we'll say, um, is that, you know, there's a big difference between receiving the lesson and learning it. And so, and there's, you know, and, and, and our lesson isn't necessarily by default, uh, recognizable, let alone learnable simply by fact of consuming the mushroom. There's quite a bit of sort of a, you know, pre-established legwork required to position ourselves conceptually and relationally um, to the experience that allows its intelligence to be recognizable and engage in a way that creates lessons or, or reveals lessons, let alone learn them. So possibly there's something there with Amanita as well, but possibly not because I have literally no idea beyond what you, <laughs> what you said here today because I've never had it. Well, the nature of psilocybin then is because it is interactive, because you're dealing with your issues with other people and relations with other people and you're awake and present for the whole thing, it requires your involvement and mm -hmm. your interaction with it mm -hmm. and then the integration period. Whereas Amanita, you were powerless when it happened and you're mostly powerless to do much during the trip and then the processing afterward is mostly watching what the Amanita has done or removed and who you are now and then going, wow, OK. And it's more like just awarenesses and being the bystander while the Amanita does the work. There's time shifting that happens. That's some serious shit. There's networking stuff that starts to happen. There's a reframing of reality and your position in the time space continuum. There's all these shifting and things that happen that you don't do, that you are not an active participant in. You just got to figure out what it means for you as you go through it. Whereas like I did eight and a half grams of psilocybin. I put that trip on video. It's on my website. And when I said, oh, my God, I just got you know, my brain just got scanned by an alien. What the fuck? And then um, another part of it that I wasn't on video where I got fucked by evil. And so both of those experiences are very disturbing. And then I spent six months trying to process that. And that was an active, very active thing. And I finally, when I did Mad Honey a month ago, that was probably the second most profound experience I've ever had on an entheogen but it showed me what happened on psilocybin and why it happened. And then I did Soma. Well, what I theorize is Soma, which is a 100% decarb with raw milk, making yogurt with Amanita. I did a large dose of that a week later. And that was the final 
um, integration of what I did on that eight and a half gram trip. Mm. And like you said, it's all very, it was very work intensive. Whereas Amanita has felt very hands off and very much a, oh, wow, what does that mean? Oh, wow, this is frightening. (laughs) Oh, my God, what are you doing to me? Which was exactly like what the trip is like. And it's it's like a continuation of the trip and watching those effects just play out in your life. Hmm. Well, you said you said three things there, each of which are interesting and could possibly be dived into a 8.5 gram mushroom trip where you got fucked by aliens. That's a whole thing that could be talked about. Uh, Then mad honey. That's a whole thing that could be talked about. Soma being, uh, you know, like a yogurt preparation made with raw milk and amanita. That's a whole other thing to talk about. <laughs> each of which you have videos on from what I understand. And each of which I am going to leave the listener to follow up with on their own so we can continue on the track that we're on now. Um, and I'd like to go into, I'd like to go into actually taking, like actually consuming the mushroom, imbibing the mushroom. Okay. So th- there's a couple of questions here. One of which is, you know, like methods of consumption. Um, which include preparations of the oral mixture as well as smoking. And then what it is that you mean by the differences between microdosing, big, you know, big trips, and why it is that the other, why it is that it's fun beforehand, then the sleep and then the afterhand could be fun or possibly challenging. That's, that's, that's three distinctly different questions, I think. Um, but I'm orienting myself by laying them down. So maybe we can just start there with like, Essentially, methods methods of consumption. Let's start there. Um, oral and smoking. The methods and the madness. <laughs> so the methods are making the tea where, you know, you just simmer it. And I have the exact directions to, you know, the details or whatever on my website. And then once you can make the tea, then you can microdose that. And the microdose, again, the thing about Amanita is it's not a one size fits all kind of thing. There's such a huge variation in the amount of actives from one mushroom to the next that you it's impossible to say what one dose should be as a guide the way you can psilocybin. So every time you make a batch, you've got to start all over on your dosing. And also you can hot dose an Amanita, which means if you can take three or four bites out of a raw one and you're fine, you could do that again to another one and get really sick. Because, again, the huge variation in the amount of actives and it does not depend on the size of the mushroom. You can have 10 times the amount of actives in uh, a small Amanita that's maybe five centimeters across. And then you can have one tenth of that in one the size of a dinner plate. So there's no consistency to it. So when you make your preparations, I have. I just made it up, but to me, it's, it just made sense. And that's to make 15 grams worth to make the tea, breaking off pieces of different mushrooms to get that 15 grams. And that way you normalize your solution in that tea, whatever you've got, you've removed the hot dose. Now it's just one consistent amount of actives in it. A lot of people are afraid to do a very high dose with any amount of iotinic acid in it. And I get that. I understand that they're terrified of getting sick and throwing up and having any kind of gastric distress. And there is a place for a 100% decarb and a full muscomol experience. I've had that experience. It is profound. It has a place, but it is my opinion again, that you need some ibotenic acid on this journey. The, if, if people are new to it, I'm saying you're going to get more out of it. If you leave some ibotenic acid in there, And you'll come away with a much more thorough experience. And if you're wanting emotional, spiritual healing, then that's to me, it's my opinion. You need you need some ibotenic acid in there. And if you slowly titrate your dose on your way up to your high dose, you lessen the chance that you're going to get really sick. But I mean, like ayahuasca, sometimes that's going to be part of it to get to the other side to where you get that cleansing healing experience. I've never experienced it with ibotenic acid because I am careful and I push that dosing. I believe microdosing before you take a large dose helps your body understand what to do with ibotenic acid. It heals what needs to be healed so that you can zoom on up quicker and you need less to do it. Totally theorizing that. Don't even quote me on that. And that could just be totally my experience. 
And then when you titrate your dose up and you don't quite get there the first time, cool. You just learned something. Give it a couple of weeks. Now you know where your starting point should be and then push further. The people that just take these huge doses and get sick and then they're terrified, like, I don't know. I don't understand doing that. I guess that's a way that you could do it if that's your personality. But I think that's why people hate the mushroom because they get cowboy about it. Well, and then people, I, that's, that, that's a thing. That's, that's not an Amanita thing. That's like a, that's a drug cowboy thing. You know, like <laughs> I, I, I once I saw Terrence or sorry, excuse me. I wish I had seen Terrence. I saw Dennis McKenna um, one time and a bunch of people were asking him about this drug and the next drug. And at some point he's like, hold on, I'm not trying all the new drugs anymore. You know, like that psychedelic cowboy life is a young man's game kind of thing. Oh, okay. And I thought that was kind of cute, uh, cute and endearing. Pardon me. I don't try to minimize yeah. it, the term cute and endearing and, and, and insightful. Um, but yeah, I mean, like start low and go slow is a pretty good guideline generally. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I see your point. I think it's an excellent point. You know, like if you just take a whole bunch and then you're like, oh, that didn't, I didn't like that. I'm going to be a negative, uh, negative representative now for this thing. It's, well, it's a, it's a bit sort of um, self-inflated in a way or, or maybe confused. But I, I interrupted you. Sorry. Please continue. And by the way, um, I love the Reddit, the sub on, on Amity and Muscaria. There's some really intelligent, cool people there. But it's so much of that cowboy attitude. And if ever you want to hear a bad narrative about this mushroom, that's the place to find it. And so if you – i that's my opinion – the middle of the road, decarbing after having either received it in the mail as dried or dried it yourself at a high enough heat that you're going to start some good conversion, simmering it with some conversion, adding lemon juice, which is a very stable acid, by the way. People are harping on citric acid out there. Citric acid is a highly unstable acid. It's nasty. You got to buy it. You know, why not just grab a couple of lemons? Lemon juice works and it's stable. That helps decarb a lot. But in doing that, you're still dealing with the natural variance of how much ibotenic acid versus muscimol you're going to have. And it's a good middle ground to start with to get what I believe is going to be the most intelligent healing experience with the mushroom wisdom, where you have done enough decarb that you're not going to just go all in and make yourself sick. And then, you know, it's all, it's nuanced. It's the mushroom is nuanced. Your body is nuanced and the way you have to approach it is nuanced. And then there's the raw version where you can eat it raw. If you find it in nature and fruiting and you can take a couple of bites and then you'll get an ibotenic acid experience. And then there's the full decarb experience, but let's focus on the one that I'm talking about first with taking the tea that's the one that most people are going to do. Smoking, it has its own reason for existing. And I'm a big believer in smoking high, high doses of it. And I do that also probably every other month. So when you take the tea, if you're able to push through, and even if you get sick or throw up, but you're able to get those high enough doses to where you break through, you know how in psilocybin, the first thing you'll do is something won't look right <laughs> in your peripheral vision <laughs> and you look and you're like, did you see that? Wow. That tree is really green, you know, and that's how, you know, you're getting started. And with Amanita, the way that, you know, you're getting started is for just this moment, you'll get this blip of unreality. Like you're not here. And then all of a sudden you were back again, or the room will shift or tilt or things will look distant. And then all of a sudden close again, like just for a brief moment. And you're like, wait, what the, f did y'all see? what the hell? And that's the beginning. And then you can, I did a, I did a trip simulation video, but like anything else, that's like a superficial overlay of the experience because it's merely visual. So some of the things that you may experience um, is a fracturing of current reality where whatever you're looking at will break off and sit beside itself and then push away and then break off and sit beside itself. So like when you look in a mirror in the corner in a dressing room where you see infinite selves going infinitely into the mirror like that, except that there's an awareness that each one of those realities are not this one, that they are different alternate realities. There's the time shifting where you feel like 
a moment has passed, like you literally just walked from the den to the kitchen and then you look at the clock and it's been two hours and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> then what? Or like there's urgencies playing with urgency. And so there's this sense of, oh, my God, something is extremely important right now, like really important. And you look around for what that is and you will get this strong feeling of it's outside. And you walk outside and all of a sudden it's urgently important that you get inside and you get inside and it's urgently important that you go to your room and you get to the room and it's urgently important that you think about this thing. Think about what thing? Think about it. It's urgent. What? Get in the den and find the answer. And that reminded me of the rabbit from Alice in Wonderland. I'm late. I'm late for a very, very important day. He never gets where he's going. So wait, how, never, how do you how do you address this urgency? I feel like I'm like <laughs> I'm listening, and as I'm listening, I'm like, okay, I'm taking notes for my Amanita trip when the time comes. I'm like, okay, the urgency. Well, that doesn't sound fun. Like, is there a way that I address this, or do I just follow that all the way down the rabbit hole? Well, it depends on the entities that come forward, and so in the European Amanitas, there's two entities. There's the Joker Amanita, and then there's the Warrior serious healing entity, which I theorize either comes from or, you know, one was first or the other was first of Loki. And, you know, that sort of lore that we hear about with, with the Joker and, and all of that, the, the jokester. And, and if the Amanitas in America seem to have much more of that laughing, joking entity, whereas the European ones seem to have much more of a, the, older, wiser, more serious, grounded entity in my experience and taking them from the different continents. And then when I took the Siberian ones, which are very important because we believe those are the ancestral first Amanita from Siberia, they had very little of the joking ones and they were like a fast track straight to the elders. But so if you get that joking entity in there, which is the it's that's what comes from the ibotenic acid side, which is why I believe it's so important to have some ibotenic acid in there so that when that does happen, you start to laugh at the absurdity of the situation. And that's the goal, right? Because it can be very stress inducing to think, holy shit, there's something I need to be paying attention to and I can't find it. I can't find it. I'm going to miss it. I'm late. I'm late for a very important day. And then hopefully you can laugh at that and be like, oh, stress is only like a mocking sort of thing in our head. It's all a part of the time construct. It's not real. We're not actually really like under threat, especially if I can actually be sitting here stepping out of reality, taking a mushroom. I really must not be under too much threat. And how much of your life are you really under threat? Or is it self-imposed or imposed by the construct? And so it makes you start to look at all that stuff. But hopefully you can laugh at it. Then the dancing kicks in. Even people that don't dance want to dance. There's a lot of energy involved. There's a lot of wanting to move. And then there's the feeling like you're flying. That's a thing where you can't feel your feet touch the ground. If you sit, you don't really feel like you're making contact you start to lose where you are in the time space construct so that you're not really sure like where you're because we're used to gravity and being down at the bottom of whatever is around. But instead, you're sort of floating, even though you see visually you're you're on the couch, but you feel like your awareness is up somewhere near the ceiling. And then when you want to get somewhere you're less aware of the fact that you're walking and aware of gravity and it feels more like you're sort of flying through the air. So there, that's where all that fly Amanita flying, you know, thing comes from. The sleep comes at some point in all of this fun and it tends to come on pretty rapidly as that ibotenic acid starts to get converted to muscovol and it reaches sort of a breakthrough dose in your body where you feel the, the is closing in and some people do actually pass out and go to sleep at that point pretty abruptly, like in a narcoleptic way where other people never really go down at that point. They're still aware and awake, but in retrospect, they won't remember it and they'll think they went to sleep. So I've had times where I've recorded myself and in my memory, I laid down and went to sleep on the couch but I did and I cleaned my kitchen and the den and was singing the whole time. But I don't I thought I went to sleep and that I was lucid dreaming, but I wasn't. I was awake and I was doing all these things. 
So people report different experiences on that sleep front, getting into the actual sleep part. So let's say it's like a 30 minute process of that muscimol increasing in your body and getting you to a point where you do go down. So let me That's, just, let me just pause you here. So ibotenic acid is what is primarily, that's the only thing that's in the mushroom when it's raw and ibotenic acid decarboxylates into muscimol and we can decarb it by heating it in some way, converting the ibotenic acid into muscimol, or we can consume it. And the effect of like, when we consume the ibotenic acid, it has its own psychoactive effect and the metabolism of it converts it into muscimol within our bodies. Is that correct? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, but that you know, again, dose dependent. Two or three bites of a raw mushroom of ibotenic acid. You know, some people I think have dosed their body to a point where they can eat more than that. But if anyone out there is wanting to experience just ibotenic acid, proceed very cautiously. But mm -hmm. yes, that's how the conversion happens, and. Uh, there is muscimol in a raw mushroom, just maybe 10% of the amount of ibotenic acid that's in it. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, please continue. The level of muscimol in the body goes, it hits past a certain threshold, the sleep begins, um, and continue. So everyone eventually passes out, and to someone else, maybe a trip sitter, they're dead asleep. Like, they are deep. They're sunken into the bed or the couch. They are out. And they are not here anymore. But to the person experiencing it, there are many different kinds of experiences of that particular time period. And for most people, they report that being anywhere between two to four. Oh, that first part is for me, usually about an hour and a half ish to two hours. And then the sleep part for most people is between two and four hours for most people two, two hours. And during that two hours, it anything from I don't remember it at all to I was aware the whole time that I was tripping and that things were happening. Some people report being able to hear what's going on around them, but most people don't. But it's more like you're aware that you're dreaming in the sense of what lucid dreaming is like, you know, you're dreaming. But most people lucid dream and they can hear the AC cut on or they can hear a car door outside and they know where they are in time and space. They know who they are. But most people, when this happens, are aware that what they're experiencing is not real, but they are not aware of their self. They're not aware that they are an adult, that they're in a where they live or where they're experiencing this. They are fully engrossed in it like it's a dream. Like when you're dreaming you don't think about your human. You think about the dream. The dream is real and what you're experiencing is reality. So it, it's a dream with awareness that this isn't reality and that you're playing a game, that you're going through the motions of something. I have not ever been able to remember a single thing from those places, except that I'm glad I didn't because when I got out of them, I felt lighter and amazing and beautiful but also like I just went through something extremely traumatic and I'm glad I don't remember until I did Soma. And then I did remember some of it. And the only I can recount like one thing where there was a tumor on my back and someone just came and ripped it off and I started bleeding everywhere. I don't know what that that's another whole thing. But it, <laughs> yeah. it was the beginning of something that I knew went deep at like cords down into my core. And I'm glad I don't remember what happened after that because I knew it was pretty traumatizing. So in the wisdom of it, it's you don't remember. But the the analogy then it is analogous to when you are tripping on mushrooms and you do leave here and you do go find the aliens or whatever or the machine elves or whoever they are. And they do what they do. You're aware you're tripping. You're just able to come in waves and come back down and speak to the people around you and go, holy shit, y'all, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing that. The only difference is you're doing that with Amanita. You just don't get to come and go at will. It's got you and you're going to stay there and it holds you down and does what it needs to do. And then when it lets you go after that two or three hours and you wake up, that's where round two happens of the awake part. 
So those are the two sides. This is such a two-sided mushroom. Because it's got the abatinic acid and muscimol. And then it's got the yin and the yang and the black and white thinking that it helps you correct. And then it's also got the two sides of the trip. You've got the beginning side of the trip. Then you've got that the middle where the sleep happens and you've got round two. And round two, I think, is the part that upsets and disturbs people the most because that's when it's very heavy on the muscimol side. And if you have control issues, I think it's going to be very upsetting and confusing. But I think if you can just allow the wisdom of the mushroom to do what it's got to do and just allow whatever's happening and sort of be at peace with it, you can find the beauty in it. So the first time that I did it, when I woke up, I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. But I had this motivation. Like I wanted to get up and do things. Like I knew stuff and I needed to get up. <laughs> Except nothing would move. I'm just laying. I couldn't even open my eyes. But I knew where I was. I could hear everything around me. I knew, you know, what date, what time it was, whatever. But I could not move. I couldn't do anything. And I was like, well, that's interesting. Cool. I guess I'll just lay here. And I laid there for what felt like 20 minutes, just dancing in my head and singing songs and just tripping around in my head. And when I was finally able to move, I looked at my phone and it was already like six o'clock in the morning. But according to my calculations, I had only been sitting there for like 20 minutes. But according to what I figured out, I had been laying there for two hours. So there's massive time distortions going on. But I've spoken to other people that in that that paralyzed state, they were terrified. They thought that they were dead. And that's the biggest thing is the paralysis. When I was able to move, I got up and fell right to the floor. So then I had to try to crawl back onto the bed and then I fell asleep again. And then that was real sleep. So I'm wondering about what the what the role of other people here might be. Like if you can hear things, you're aware of stuff going on. Like, is there a likelihood that you can minimize the um, the the panic or not panic, but like that paranoia that comes on the other side when you're paralyzed? If you have somebody else there, um, I guess you can't communicate with them. But I'm just wondering about what the role of another person is. Like when you're doing these journeys, are they the journey of the alone into the alone as Kalindi used to say, quoting <laughs> Terrence, who was quoting someone else? Um <laughs> Or is it like well served with a sitter? I believe when you first journey, you should always have someone with you just in case you take too much and they really cannot get you to come around and they start to worry and hours have gone by and they're really concerned. There are no deaths on record from this mushroom. There are from mixing alcohol with it. That combination can be deadly. But people that just take insane amounts can wind up in the hospital in a medically, when you measure it, coma, which is basically just muscimol turning everything off and you don't have free will of choice of motion and hearing or whatever. You're offline for a while, but they spontaneously recover after 24 hours and they walk out of the hospital, no worse for wear and a large medical bill unless you have socialized medicine and a story to tell. And so the best thing that you can do is have a trip center there, but not really expecting them to be of much help or worth or value other than someone to talk to and laugh with. Yeah. But once you go down, you're going to have long periods of not being able to communicate with anybody. And you are, it is a journey on your own. And perhaps if you're a very dependent person and you don't know your self-worth and you don't know your strength and you don't know your ability this can be an important journey to take. You know how men historically have had those journeys and rites of passage at 13. A lot of women have that if they give birth and women that don't give birth or men that have transitioned and haven't had that experience. Amanita can really be a journey like that into the self, into helplessness and then learning. Oh, wow. Like I just feel like I traveled lifetimes and I conquered demons and I now know what I'm capable of and what I'm worth and what I can do. It's been terrifying the places I've gone by myself. I've tripped enough now that I have been able to get myself to move, to walk, to crawl on the floor. And by crawling from the kitchen to my bathroom, I journeyed through space and time and I encountered terrifying things. And 
over and over. I'm like, why can't I just yell to get some help here? And then when it's over, I'm glad I didn't. And I look back on it with a lot of not pride. What's the word? I look back on it with a sense of accomplishment. Mm. I don't know what the word is. I mean, accomplishment is what came to my mind, but I don't know the experience you're having. Um, yeah, maybe something like uh, the acknowledgement of one's own courage or something like that. Um, that, yeah, I'm like that. So let's, uh, okay, so I don't know if there's more you wanted to add there. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about both microdosing and then the value and the place smoking the Amanita has. Yeah. Microdosing is medicine and it always sets me straight. You know, when things get hard or life gets confusing and I start to get anxiety, I love my microdosing. It's important. It's necessary. And I, I trip on it with the tea every couple of months to get my, my mind right and to stay healthy. But I love to smoke it because that is a trance like state. And that is a fast track to the elders. Hmm. I mean, they come up pretty rapidly. It's not at all a dancing thing. There's not any, any of those experiences I just described. It, it's a completely different experience when you smoke it. You do get a sense of floating, but barely. There's a warmth that washes over. There's a sense of correctness and peace, but very rapidly the back of my head opens up and I feel the lineages of my ancestors and the lineages of the mushrooms ancestors as far back as time can go. I feel them standing there. I feel their wisdom. I feel their joy that I've knocked on their door again. I feel connected to them. I feel stable. I feel the longevity. I feel the groundedness of it. And then it just gets deeper until I start to withdraw from my current present reality and they draw me backward, like back in time. And I do that mostly for ceremonies. Like when we do the solstice ceremonies, I smoke it when I'm going to be playing drums. There's a lot of wisdom in the ancestors that we have forgotten is extremely important and feeling very grounded today. A lot of us really feel like we're just floating. And I don't mean just our elders who are here with us today or just our grandparents, not just our genetic ancestors going back a couple of generations, but elders that we've never met, elders that that go back thousands of years. Some of the first people that ever used the mushroom. There's wisdom in all of those different people's lives and the ways that they solved problems. And there's a groundedness in being in touch with those voices that help us learn. We are not a solitary life trying to figure it out alone. It was all figured out already mm. thousands and thousands of times. And all we have to do is ask. And all I ever have to do now when I smoke it is ask. And the answers come pretty rapidly. Mm. So let, let's talk about microdosing then, because you're talking about microdosing earlier. You're talking about it as a way to sort of get a sense of the dose of what you got, sort of the potency of what you got, but also something about conditioning your body to be more effectively managing the presence of ibotenic acid. But then what uh, what does it look like? I, I guess I want a little bit more detail about like what it, what is it like to microdose um microdose, I assume the tea of Amanita. Um, and is it, is its role to prepare for bigger doses or does it have a role onto its own? Yeah, it has a role onto its own. And it's to me, you can microdose and never do anything else. And it will probably be one of the most profound medicines that, that you can take. And, and it will change you in very profound ways. But if you are going to journey on into these other realms, then mystically, I can say you are communing with that mushroom and you're getting the mushroom voice and it's learning who you are. It's developing a communication with you. It's, it's starting a rapport with you so that when you do get to the larger doses, the two of you know each other really well and it's going to be much more effective. Physiologically, I theorize that what it's doing is an adaptogen is the two sides, the ibotenic acid and muscle are balancing out the two sides of your fight or flight 
response and healing your receptors and helping to balance out your neurotransmitters that it's involved in. And in that way is healing a lot of things for you in your daily life and how you function and your physiological responses to the world around you and healing that system. If it's been offline for far too long or functioning too much in one side and not in the other or whatever. So if that's all you ever did was microdose, you will create profound changes for yourself. But when you take it, you won't, you shouldn't notice anything except like maybe if you had a beer, you just notice you're a lot more calm. But when did it kick in? Like you're not really sure. But it's not life changing in that one moment to drink a beer. You know, like it should, that's kind of the nature of microdosing, subperceptible. But I wouldn't say it's subperceptible. I would say you, you, you can perceive it. You can feel it. You can feel that you're calmer and a little more relaxed. And I would say when you're trying to find your first microdose, is if you don't feel anything at all, like you're still amped up or you're still nervous or whatever, you didn't take enough, but measure what you're taking. So, you know, what your microdose is, you know, a quarter of a teaspoon in American measurements, and then work your way up until you remember, you realize you're not anxiety. You don't have anxiety anymore. You're not like upset about anything. You feel calm. Like, like if you had a beer, Mm -hmm. then, you know, that's your good, that's a good microdose. And then try to take less the next time and see do you you know you see i'm saying like work with it play with it until you see where that where you get that at sure i mean it's a similar protocol to find your right dose on any micro dose um is to start with a really little bit and then bring it up until you notice you have an effect and then maybe a little bit more is that too much oh okay now take a step back down kind of thing so that makes sense um Okay. Uh, I think I have one, one last question before, uh, before maybe call, calling to a close here. Um, which is that how long does this tea last in the fridge? <laughs> it's actually lasted pretty long for me. If you're responsible about your storage containers and you, like what I do is I get four different containers and make the tea and split it into fourths. And if you boil those containers, you know, sterilize them and just be really careful with your handling of everything. They can last a long time. But I stick those in the freezer and I'll leave one out. But I've had the longest I've had one in the refrigerator last is three weeks. It was Hmm. pretty crazy. So that's how I deal with that. That way, you know, once that one's gone, you can just pull another one out of the freezer and use it. Doesn't seem to lose potency by Hmm. freezing it or anything. Great. Cool. Um, So. Just wondering if there's anything else. Um, I want to tell people that YouTube um, started taking down all mushroom content, even legal content. Like my, this mushroom is legal in almost every country. It's not legal in Great Britain. It's not legal in Australia, but that law is about to potentially change. That's That law is getting challenged in Australia. And even though it's legal here, um, they've considered it a deadly and dangerous illegal substance, and they've removed all of my content. So I had to build a website. So it's just AmanitaDreamer.net or com, either one. And that's where I've moved all of my information to. So but the, the YouTube channel, I deal with a lot of mental health issues and spiritual issues and nature of reality issues and manifesting issues, which this mushroom sort of lends it. I think, well, any mushroom, any entheogenic journey, you can't isolate what's happening, you know, the mental health growth, the spiritual things that you start to think about and the nature of reality. So I park all of that on YouTube because they'll allow that. But if I mention this mushroom, it's got to go on the website. Mm-hmm. And you also have a bit shoot um, page as far as I understand as well. I haven't been uploading there as much because now I'm because of the censorship, I realize the importance of all of us who are making content to get on as many platforms as possible. Mm-hmm. That if we don't keep moving it we're going to get left behind facebook is starting to i'm on facebook i do all my live videos i do that the second saturday of every month and they i hear are starting to well i know they're taking down a lot of groups that deal with this mushroom i've watched several of them get taken down now and then instagram i'm doing i work uh, with the san francisco psychedelic society here for the next three months doing workshops and now they're censoring those posts so this censorship thing is getting serious and people that create their own spaces like you have, we are going to continue to hopefully be islands and bastions of information that can't get censored. 
So if everyone is out there hoping that they can continue keeping up with their creators and their information and stay educated about entheogens and safe use and harm reduction and the politics and the legalities by staying on social media, you're going to slowly get left behind because you don't think about you haven't heard from this person in a while. And then if you do think about them and they're gone and you didn't find them where they moved to, that's just one less intelligence that you that has been taken away from you. So I encourage people to find your people, find them everywhere and ask them to spread out and be everywhere so that we can just keep moving. And anyway, the answer, long answer to your question is um, I quit uploading to BitChute because now there's no reason. And it's all I can do to handle two websites and all of the social media that I now have to handle and keep uploading and making the content. I mean, I'm backlogged for like 30 videos that I'm trying to make. So Hmm. I don't maintain bit sheet really anymore. Well, we'll see what happens to my content so far. I have, uh, I have only, I have only suffered demonetization. Nothing has been removed except once at one point I had, I had been getting videos removed and getting like community violation strikes because I had a link that went to my book. And, and the reason it was a violation is because the, they said that I was linking to the sale of illicit contraband. And I went back and forth with YouTube over and over again. Literally, it took like almost four months. They would be like, that was a mistake, you know, and, but it would just keep happening. And then they'd be like, yeah, we've corrected it. But then I would get a community violation again. And I'm like, what is happening here? You know, eventually got corrected, but, uh, but yeah, I have yet to see any of my videos removed. So far, I haven't checked today. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, they took down a video because I had a link to an article where physicians were discussing the nature of benzodiazepines. Hmm. And they took it down. And they, they would not give that back. They said I was linking to a site that sold illegal substances. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's... Uh, well, I mean, really, how much can we rely on the algorithms of big tech to uh, differentiate what's real and what isn't? And at the same time, how much can we really rely on community validation to know what's real and what isn't anymore? Because it, it's a bit of a, <laughs> yeah. it's a, speaking of, you know, cowboys, it's a bit of a wild west for truth out there. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to get confused um, as much as there's a lot of opportunity to be enlightened. So it's uh, hopefully, hopefully we figure our feet out in all of this in a way that is, you know, like less harmful than it is. Um, yeah, less, less harmful than it appears to be now on either side, be the unnecessary, like the rampant spread of harmful mis and disinformation, as well as the harmful censoring of what otherwise is fair, reasonable, um, and valid information. Um, due and to, as we move toward yeah. legalization of these substances, what good is it if they're legal if all of our accurate information has been removed? Sure, and, and we and, don't know how to use them. Yeah, and 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 what what good is? Well, I mean, what good is it legal? Okay, but you know, there there is a good lost. There's a possibility of something posi positive lost when the people in the places that have been cultivating culture, proper culture, like human making culture around these substances, you know, in the modern world. You know, as in like people that aren't like, I'm not an indigenous person, right? So like we're figuring it out on our own in some sense, right? That when all of that culture is taken away because it's links to illicit substances and when people are having their legal psilocybin trip with the therapist that was probably not even legally allowed to have their own trip before giving you one and they don't have any way to offer you anything other than psychological psychologizing your experience and attempting to rationalize away anything that is outside of the paradigm of of psychiatry in some way that that, that there won't be anywhere for them to comfortably step into or safely or accessibly step into from a culture standpoint around sense making all of this um which is kind of what i'm doing and i anticipate is in some sense what you're doing is to try to help have that as a resource for people so now, there's so much bad information about this mushroom that my goal is to resort to the science and when the science doesn't have answers go to the people that are still using it from long lines of use and listen to their stories and their lore and ask questions mm -hmm. and then put that together with all the anecdotal information that I'm getting on my forum and the websites and all the messages I get, you know, after two and a half years now, it's like thousands of experiences. So I want to be 
hopefully as accurate as I can be in any one day. And I'm just continuing to learn and update. We'll see mm -hmm. until the science can catch up. 30 years from now, we'll know everything about Amanita like we do about cannabis. Yeah. But it's just going to, it's going to take some time. Yeah. Well, um, I appreciate you being on the show today. Uh, I appreciate your comments uh, about the concern. Oh, I appreciate all your comments. It was really, it was a good chat. So I really, I, I'm, I, I'm thankful. Um, and I feel excited about trying Amanita myself now, probably following your, you know, microdosing protocols. I got two protocols and I'm very interested in, in exploring the Amanita now, but also a microdosing salvia protocol. But I'm presently in the midst of a large scale writing project that's about psilocybin. And I don't really want to be having journeys that allocate a lot of bandwidth towards understanding other things while I'm still in the process of, uh, you know, being rewritten by by a book project. Uh, so yes, on that note, pardon me, uh, on that note, can you maybe uh, remind the people where they can find access to your work online? I am at amanitadreamer.com or .net. And from there, you'll find all the other jumping off points. We have a forum. I do workshops, speaking engagements, and uh, my Patreon, we do Zoom meetings. So that's fun. I get to actually meet everybody. and It's part of the tribe. <laughs> cool. Thank well, you so much. This has been amazing. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, and uh, on that note, Amanita Dreamer, thank you so much for being on Adventures Through the Mind and uh, looking forward to following your work from here. Thank you so much. And cut. Okay, that's all. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Adventures Through the Mind. If you like what Amanita had to say, head over to AmanitaDreamer.net, check out her work, her many vlogs, uh, and that stuff there. Um, and she just launched her Etsy page today, apparently, so you can head in there and uh, check some of the stuff out on that page. You could support her directly by purchasing something off her store. And if you'd like to support the show as well, you can do so by heading to any of the links in this page, such as heading over to Patreon to become a patron of the show, or leaving a one-time donation through PayPal or cryptocurrency, or even buying something off my own shop. So uh, thank you very much for supporting this content, be it an Amanita Dreamer or myself. Um, and thank you so much for tuning in all the way to the end. I will see you on the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. And until then, take care. bonus if you're still listening. I created a subreddit quite a while ago, and if you are interested in participating in discussion about these episodes, please head over to the subreddit, which is r at mine podcast. The subreddit is still growing, <laughs> so the more people on there and the more people engaging, the more robust and uh, interesting it'll be as a place to be. So come over and uh, drop us a line, drop a comment or a question. I'm on there as well, and uh, yeah. So see you on, see you on Reddit and uh, see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening so far in that you actually got to the PS at the end of the outro. I, I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> meandering on too long and cut.